Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this week's episode of Ohm School Live. Uh, as you may have seen in the email, and you're certainly see on, seeing on the screen now, Lisa is not going to be here today. She is um, she's tending to some family business, no emergency or anything like that. I believe she's helping them move or something like that. So um, we had a choice. We could either run a rerun and do uh, something that we had done before, which we did once before. And um, But I, I decided I just thought I would just take the time to uh, uh, just talk a little bit, lead a meditation, uh, answer some questions, kind of hit the pause button on Ohm School Live, which has been, you know, nonstop. This is actually our our fortieth episode since we had gone um, just doing it video, uh, producing it ourselves, and our eightieth, if you count the ones we did on Ohm Times Radio before this. Um, so we've been doing this now for um, well almost two years, and uh, no sign of slowing down at at this point. So I thought I would just pick a subject, talk about it a little bit, kind of set the tone, and then go into a meditation and, to, and uh, take requests, as it were. And the subject that I chose was, was a word that I hadn't really heard very often, and I just ran, acro I ran across it a couple years ago, a few years ago, in one of the Buddhist sutras. And the sutras, of course, are, are sermons that the Buddha himself gave, with a couple of exceptions. The Heart Sutra is not one, but was clearly in, was clearly in, in line with, it was given by his kind of his number one guy, Avalokiteshvara. Um, so it's included in the list of sutras. And mentions the, the Buddha lands, which is such an interesting an interesting thing. So I titled this The Buddha Land of, of the Soul. Um, originally of, of your soul, but I thought I, I need to make it more I I I expansive. Because, you know, in the West, we think of, we think of our soul really as, my, as kind of my individualized personality. Like this, I don't know, this amorphous little thing that lives inside the body, and when the body dies, it goes somewhere else. But it's very much a form. Right, it's a form you can you know poke your hand through. It's transparent; you can see through it. But it's very much a form, a very much an individualization, which is why the word soul doesn't work very well, and you never hear it in Buddhism, um, because they don't see it as an individualized soul. But we could take the word soul, <coughs> as as um, as Christian myst and Sufi mystics have, and expand it to re to be yet another name for God, another name for the ultimate, the one soul. And so I've called it the Buddha land of the soul, the one singular soul. Because the word Buddha uh, in Sanskrit means the awakened one. Now normally, because of our idea of individualized being and individualized souls, we, we see that as being um, an awakened being. I am awake. And of course we have those words. Bodhisattva means one who is awake. Uh, an awakened being. Jiva mukta, Mukti. Jivan Mukta is uh, also one who is awake and yet, with a, and yet with, a, with a body. But in this case, what it's referring to is the one. The only one. The only one that ever existed. And the true awakening, the awakening to your true nature, the one true soul, is to awaken to the fact that you are that one. In, in other words, the personal sense of your existence dissolves into the universal sense of the one being. So that all of this, everything you see, touch, taste, smell, experience, is the self is the one being, the, the essence. And so even the word self becomes, it's a, it's a theme, it's a motif 
that runs throughout all being, where every, everything is forever saying, I am, I am, I am, but the I that it's pointing at is the awakened one, the Buddha. And that word Buddha land, to me, remember, none of these deeply spiritual words have concrete meanings. They're, they're meant to be provocative. They're, they're meant to be something that you chew on, that you come to... You, you, you come to find what it means within your own being. It is not, it's not somebody, okay, this is what it means, and then you adopt that. That's human knowledge. Spiritual knowledge is revelation. It's revelatory. It is the direct experience of Buddha knowledge. And so the Buddha land is really referring to the vastness and the magnitude of your being once the sense of being has become liberated from this idea that somehow I'm this finite being, that I am the body, and that consciousness is nothing other than a function of matter, or a, a, a more religious view is that I'm a soul within a body, but yet I'm very much limited, that this soul is capable of sin and, and, and bad things and, and the like all of which are conceptualizations that once believed, they literally confine us within the prison of our own beliefs. In the Heart Sutra, the, this liberation is referred to as the breaking down of the walls of the mind. Because you are inhibited, not by the truth, <laughs> not by reality. You're not limited by reality. You're limited by misunderstanding of reality. That thinking, thinking that you are something other than the one being. That, that somehow being has been divided into beings instead of the one universal existence. It's kind of like silence, right? Can you, can, and there's silence there and there's silence over here, but there's no silence in, in between. Can you divide silence up? Same thing with space. Right? How, can you divide space up? Is the space wherever you happen to be in the space where I am here in Seattle, is, it, is the space different? The content's different. Is your being in its essence and my being in its essence inherently different? Or, or is it simply different modes of expression, a different configuration of the same thing. You know, one computer can be running <laughs> a particular uh, software program, right? A, a, a word processor, another, a, an audio editor, a, another, you know, the web browser. But the, the, essential, the essential mechanism that is running all those programs is identical. The being the beingness, the ultimate infinite being that produces all manifestation is the same being in every single case. The only mistake we've made is that we've mistaken the form, the, 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 the program, as it were, for the, for the, and limited the potential of that which, in which the program is simply running. The mission of the spiritual teacher is to liberate you from the idea that you are the body, that you, consciousness, have been confined within a body, or are defined by the body, or are created by the body. You're not the body, nor are you a soul inhabiting the body. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. The body and all of experience, everything you, everything you see, touch, taste, smell, and hear, is in fact happening within you. We mistake the inner for the outer. And this is the only thing we suffer from. So, um, on, on that note, <laughs> I don't know how far we've gone, let's just enter into a little meditation. <clears throat> yeah, I'm looking at the questions come in, come in, and I will I will take them all up. Thank you for that. Thank you for these questions. This is this is really good. This is really really good. 
So, but let's start out with just a sip on my tea, a sip on your tea if you have it, or coffee or latte or whatever it is you happen to enjoy in the morning, if it's your morning. I know for some of you it's in the evening. And I just forget all the notifications that may be coming up on your screen. And really honor yourself with a moment of true introspection. So as you close your eyes now and just let your attention just sink into this present moment, I want you to just divest yourself of all your ideas as to what meditation is. That there's something to get out of it. That there's some prize or reward at the end. And just enter into this meditative moment for its own sake. For whatever truth it holds in its own nature. We're very goal-oriented here in the West. We do everything for the result that it's going to get. Everything we do turns out to be a stepping stone to get somewhere else. I'm inviting you to let this moment be the end result. Not a stepping stone to somewhere else, but the actual end in and of itself. And notice the effect that has on your mind. It may be even a little bit shaky about it. It's like, what? What am I going to get out of this? What's next? Notice that activity of the mind. <clears throat> and then notice that you're noticing it. That there's something very, very subtle that is aware of the, that thought and even the, the feelings within the body of, I want to get something. What's next? And instead, let all of your attention be right here and right now. Not even trying to get rid of that feeling of what's next. Or to think that meditation is going to somehow free me of making everything a stepping stone to something else. Because even that is a subtle intention. Really letting go of all intent to just be here, just be present. And then notice that when, when you do that, there is just this very quiet sense of your own being. which is not something you arrive at. You're simply noticing what's actually here, right now. And notice this is not an unpleasant discovery. There's a certain kind of quiet to it. It's effortless. You didn't create it. You didn't have to get to it. You simply removed your attention from everything that kept it focused on the future, even a future a few moments away. And what you found was presence. Beingness. And 
isness. I amness. So let's just leave all the aspirations and ambitions aside for a moment. You can pick them up later. There's nothing wrong with our human desires and ambitions, but we want to find something else. We want to find ourselves that's prior to our ambitions and desires, which obviously come and go, but something isn't coming and going. And I don't even want you to put a name on it. Don't try to name it. This is the soul, or this is God, or this is truth. Or don't even put a name on it. Just feel it. And it is a very subtle feeling, but not like any other kind of feeling there is. It's like just a sensing, a knowingness. And if you search it, see if you can find a boundary to this, just this sense. Does it have an end or a beginning? If you walked far enough, could you, could you find the end of it? And if you did, what would be on the other side? Now it's still and as quiet as it is. Where are you? We call it an it as if we are kind of looking at something, right? A feeling, a, a very subtle sense. But where are you in this picture? How far away from you is this? This is a boundary past which our conceptual minds simply can't go. Notice how there's a very strong impulse to, to make the, well, there's, there's me and I'm looking at this, or I'm feeling this. But if there's no boundary to it, Is it actually something other than you? Is it an it at all? Or is this yourself? Seeing yourself directly, nothing in between, not even the thoughts of a subject and an object, one thing looking at another, but the pure experience of I. So everything we're talking about, no boundary, no beginning, no end, we're talking about you. You have no beginning. You were never born. You have no end, you'll never die. You have no, bo no boundary, no limits. The 
This is the true self. This is the Buddha land. This is the realm in which all Buddhas have walked. This is the realm from which all Buddhas have spoken. All the sages of all time have been speaking from here. When they used the word I, they were referring to this. When they used the word God, they were referring to this. When Christ spoke of my father or our father, he was talking about this. When the prophet said, when you, to, when you know yourself, you will know your Lord, he was talking about this. The primary experience called mystic, called spiritual, called non-dual, called non-phenomenal, but it is simply yourself. The religious word that gets used is God, Christ consciousness or Buddha nature. I much prefer the street name. This is simply me. Without any reference to anything else. Me before any conditioning took place, before any other thought arose. Me. The original. The Alpha and the Omega. That which said, let there be light. And just sit for a second in that quiet. Your mind is probably shaking a bit. It's okay. Notice that it's shaking and notice that you can notice that it's shaking. <laughs> that there's always something, no matter what activity is going on in mind, body, or emotions, there's always this subtle presence to which it is appearing. And could anything appear, thought, emotion, or sensation? if you were not here first for it to appear to. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. So take a nice <clears throat> deep breath and <clears throat> As I often like to point out, as we begin to come back to this episode and, you're, and you start to open your eyes, you're not leaving this place. You can't. Because if you left this place, there would be no experience. You would cease to exist. So this place and you are one. It cannot be left. You can only open your senses to take in other information, other thoughts, other points of view. But it is always here that all of those experiences are received and acknowledged. This is the, this is the seat of consciousness, the self-existent seat of consciousness. So, breathe a little bit, open your eyes, and uh, I'm going to check out some of the questions here now. Um, and feel free to leave a comment, your experience on the meditation, or, uh, or uh, any kind of question you have, whether you have one now or you brought one with you. <laughs> and once again, those of you who may have checked in late, Lisa had some family things she had to attend to. Nothing serious, just some family members she had to help out. So I decided to just kind of fly alone for this week's uh, episode of Ohm School Live. So let's see, let's see, Rosario and Ava and hello, Peggy Wood, um, Amelal, Amelal. There's Roberto, hello, sir, nuclear cloud. Did Buddha value physical life on earth? Beautiful, beautiful question. You know, he was often accused of nihilism because of his teaching of no self. It was so vastly misunderstood that he was accused of what, in fact, 
materialists today assert. And that is that nihilism means that none of this has any meaning, no, no purpose, that it begin, the end is oblivion, it's over. Now, the, the strict materialists, which have dominated um, really science and theology and medicine for, for about a century, um, have held to the idea that experience was completely a function of material organization, including consciousness, which meant that when the body dissolved, that is, you died, you literally died. It was oblivion. There was nothing left. A complete um, unawareness. Nihilism. You ceased to exist in totality. And I've heard very people that I admire, right, comment, who comment on a lot of a lot of things, both socially and politically, and the like, who take that position. Um, many leading scientists do, very vocal scientists do, that take that position. There are many though that don't, that are saying there's something qualitatively different about about consciousness. Now, what Buddha was always trying to do was to separate con the sense of self, the se sense of e my own existence, from all of the things that it had become attached to, like the body, the fear that somehow this body dies, I die, which you know takes its modern form in, ma in the materialism, or physical realism is another way it's been, been called. And so what he said was, there's no self. And so this was interpreted as, oh, I don't really exist, I'm just this functioning and then I'm going to cease to... There, you, and there'll be cease to be anything when this is over, which is not at all what he meant. What he was trying to point out is that merely combining a bunch of things together to make a form that does not give rise to a self, it does not give rise to an entity. Conceptually, we think of it that way. So this body is an incredibly complex function, trillions of self cells, tens of trillions of cells, hundreds of trillions of little bacteria and things <laughs> going on, you know, digestion and all, and all sorts, of, uh, sorts of stuff like that. All of them functioning together to make this, this coherent form that I'm driving around, right? Does that make a self? Am I nothing more than the combination? The materialist would say, yes, I am. That's all there is to it. Buddha would say, no, it's not. Look, take it apart. There's nothing in this body that is made of little bodies. There's nothing in this body that is sentient. There's nothing in this body that's holding it all together. What is holding it all together is not a self. So he was very clear that the way we normally think about the self was a soul, an individual being of some sort made up of little, little piece parts. And even if you make, think of it as a soul, something ephemeral that leaves the body, any kind of form is going to be a form. A bunch of things coming together to make what? Uh, a being? And so he said that the being was projected onto the form. And so he re would refer to the no self or emptiness. That is, that which just is, it simply exists without a form. It is being itself. And so he used uh, the, I, the idea of no self to break down our normal conceptions. There's no self in the person. Right? The person, right? there's a functioning here going on, right? but it does not make me. I am aware of the functioning. As he put, there's a road, there's a traveling on the road, but there's no traveler. So there's also no self in things, and that's easy to see. Everything that makes up the flower, none of which makes up this flower, is a flower. There are all these little piece parts that make this, when it comes together, is this mysterious whole that is stunningly beautiful. Right? And, and this is a big one, he said, there is no self in teaching, in, the, in dharmas. In other words, all teaching, all concepts, all ideas, all theories, everything we believe to be true about politics, religion, economics, spirituality, is transient. It, it has no real self to it. It is relative. It is conceptual. It is of the moment. 
and therefore not the absolute truth. What was the absolute truth? The absolute truth is what he referred to as the Buddha, the one, the one being. And so he had the utmost respect and love, hold on, back, back to it, for, for physical life, but he just didn't see it as physical. <laughs> for him, there was no physical life. Life was not physical at all. That that which animates this, that the, the force, the power that holds this together, right, that makes this body a coherent whole, is not in the body. Christ put it this way. He said that the tree bends where the wind blows, but you can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going. Now, if we were ignorant, we might think, that the, that the tree was bending of its own accord. And we take it apart, we look for the structures. Well, what structure is contracting like a muscle to make it bend? Not recognizing that it is simply bending due to an external force. Something external is moving it, at least apparent external to this. And he was pointing at the, what he would call God or the Father, what Buddha would call Buddha nature, did not exist in the thing, was everywhere, was formless in and of itself, but it was that that animated and, and brought everything together to make the forms. And so for the Buddha, there was no physical world. Physical is a concept. We made it up. Right? You're having an experience right now of me. We believe it to be an external physical thing. The Buddha said, no, it's not true. There is no external existence. It is all the manifestation of consciousness being perceived by consciousness, in consciousness, and made of consciousness. I know Lisa and I don't normally get into this, <laughs> this level of discussion during the show, but here we are. She's not here to, uh, to reel me in, so <clears throat> I can get in trouble. Um, so, nuclear cloud, hopefully that answers it for you. Anato, who caused us to make that mistake? N nobody did. If, <clears throat> if you say there's somebody that, something that caused that, you've literally created a, a, a devil, a demon, which is what which a traditional Christianity has done. They've made, almost, they've made a, a god called the devil just a little less powerful than, than the god, that are in this constant warfare. Where does an illusion come from? Now, this is the best way I can put it. If you're, you're hot and thirsty, you're walking through the desert, the sun's beating down, and you look off in the distance and you see a mirage. Who, put it in your terms, who caused that mirage? Did something cause that mirage out there? It doesn't exist. There's nothing there. It's an illusion. Right? An illusion that grows out of what? The sand is there, the heat is there, my thirst is there, the sun beating down is there, the intense heat rising from the sand, making ripples in the atmosphere. They're all there. And on that, I project myself my desires, my ambitions, onto this world. And an illusion is created. So in a sense, you could say, I caused myself to make that mistake. My ignorance caused me to make that mistake. Believing that what my senses told me is the truth may cause me to make that mistake. But in a sense, and this is, this, this is often a hard one for people to grasp, but it's not a mistake. <laughs> you know, the, the little child, animals, your pets, right? as far as I know, even this flower, right? they have a, a, a holistic, undifferentiated view of things. The child doesn't see mom and dad, doesn't see hand, flower, has no names, has no concepts. It has not created a world in its mind. 
it's not created a representation of experience in the mind, which is then have concepts, this is, oh, this is this and this is that, right? This is good, this is bad, this is beautiful, this is ugly. It doesn't have any of that. It's pure experience, right? We can imagine that. In a sense, in that meditation we went to, that's where you were. There was not conceptualizing, it was just pure experience. It was undifferentiated consciousness. But the, 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 the dog, the flower, the child, are not consciously aware of it. They are simply in that space. How do we become consciously aware that this is the reality? Well, there's only one way for that to happen. We must first fall into the delusion, get lost in the mind, and then rediscover the undifferentiated consciousness from the point of view of someone who knows differentiated consciousness. This is the path of the Buddha. This is the path of spirituality and awakening. I'm awakening to what I've always known, but now I know it, not as the child, but as the sage. And that's the difference. The sage is a child that knows they're a child. That may seem a little bit out there. And, and forgive me, I, I constantly look for different ways in which I can express this. But when you look at it, how, how do you, you know, who caused the illusion, that mirage in the desert? Who caused the, the, the illusion of, of the earth being stationary and the sun moving across it? Did the sun suddenly stop moving and the earth spinning when I realized it was an illusion? No, the ignorance simply disappeared. Who caused the ignorance? Nothing, nobody. It simply arose out of the distortion. It's a, it was a thought that arose out of nowhere. It had no origin. It had no cause. There was no intention behind it. Right? So, focus your attention on seeing through the illusion and the question as to who caused it will fall away. You'll see that nobody caused it. <laughs> and you'll be free of it, which is more important. Oh, thank you, Anita. A very, a very wise question. David and Elaine, hello, hello to you, hello, hello, hello's Peter in Italy. Brenda, hello Brenda. How do you gain the desire to stay here in this body once you've enjoyed being fully in the spirit? I, I often want to stay there. Um, the way you do that is to collapse the illusory boundary between there and here. See, in the, you, you've got a, the mind has said, okay, there's there, and that's joy and bliss, and then there's here, and it's not. Right? Who created that boundary? Now, when you are in that state of the, the bliss and spirit and wonder and the f freedom of it, and you are also experiencing, uh, or then later you're experiencing a sense of contraction and limitation, are you different? See, this is the key. It's kind of the nature of the ambition of Western spirituality is to somehow create a state of perpetual bliss. It's not possible. Because if you did, you'd get bored. <laughs> because bliss is only recognizable as bliss in the presence of that which is not bliss. Joy is only known in the presence of grief, happiness in the presence of sadness. Love is the most intense when it is lost, right? And you could feel, when you're deeply in love with somebody, and you just, every moment you're away, it's intensely painful, right? So that love and that pain are one, right? The, the two sides are one. The entire experience of life is the experience of the contrast of the of the yin and yang. Without them, there is no experience of life. What I'm pointing at is to that which is the aware of all of the experience, the ups and the downs, 
and is beyond both. And notice that the preference for one over the other is that not also simply a state of mind that is being witnessed by something else deeper? That is the place that is beyond what's even called bliss. It is pure emptiness, pure shunyata, pure stillness, pure peace. It has no preference for the opposites. It lets the opposites dance. And as such, without preference, it knows nothing but peace and joy. It is the contentment that is the true ananda. It is not the happiness that arises out of, of, of experiences that correspond with our desires. <laughs> it is not pleasure. It is pure joy. It is contentment. It is that which recognizes the dance of opposites, surrenders to it, and, and in that surrender ends all suffering. Not all experience, but all suffering. With the beauty of this flower right here, would it, would, it be, would it be less or more without this, without knowing that this was where it's headed? I have some other plants over there on my, on my um, uh, uh, mantle over the, over the fireplace. And these flowers have lasted a really long time. But when they start going and drooping and dying and turning dark, I don't throw them out. I keep them until they're just completely gone because it's the entire experience. Here's a bud, right? This bud may turn into this flower. But this isn't going to happen without this. Now we can sit there and go, well, yeah, it's just kind of a big green thing. This, compared to this, there's no comparison. This is stunning. You know, you could stare at it all day. But I can also see right around the edges, the browning beginning to happen. This is going to become this, and eventually these will all turn black and fall off. Should I appreciate this any less? Because without this, this won't happen. Without this, this won't happen. This is the timeless cycle of being. I am embracing Shiva's wheel. Right. You embrace your five-year-old, the ten-year-old, the fifteen-year-old, the, the one who did all the stupid things because, they, because they're all here now. And boy, have I done some stupid things not even that long ago. Right. I, I have to embrace them all because this is the full experience of being. I want you to have life to the fullest. The problem is that for, for most of us, we've suffered so much, and, and these days it's so intense, that when we get a taste of that bliss, of that heavenly bliss, we go, oh God, I'd never want to let go of it. And it's understandable. But you cannot hold on to it. The, the act of holding on to it instills, sometimes dramatically, sometimes subtly, a fear of losing it, which is exactly what you're talking about, isn't it? There's the fear of losing it. And then when it's gone, it's like, oh no, my God, I lost it. What have you lost? You've only had an experience shift. Have you lost you? Without you, that consciousness, could any experience be at all? So have you lost what is most important? Have you lost that which allows you to have experience? You can't lose that, because that is what you are. It is not a possession that you lose or gain. It is what you are and have always been, which cannot not be lost or gained. It is self, uh, self-existent, self-validating, self-sustaining, self-luminating. You are that which makes everything else possible. And no matter what happens, it cannot touch you. It cannot affect you. Like a cloud going through the sky doesn't leave a trace in the sky. Does that answer it for you, Brenda? Or at least point you in the right direction? Lovely question. Important question. Carl. Carl Lucy, I think you're in, I think you're in Ireland. Right. Hi, GP. Why is who we truly are created in such a way that some people search for a lifetime for it? Would it not be more beneficial to consciousness and the planet if it was easier to connect at an earlier age 
Um, no, it wouldn't. At the earlier age, you're already connected. It is only by losing the connection that we gain it. He who loses his life for my sake shall find it. This is what Christ meant by that. He wasn't talking about dying physically. He was ta talking about we have to come to let go of what we think is real. You know, I, I can't explain in all the detail why it works the way it does. I just know that it does. You know, oftentimes the why is really a very, is, is a thinly veiled or sometimes thickly veiled argument that says this shouldn't be happening. It, it is happening. It did happen. You experienced the fall. Now, I can tell you that the ultimate realization is that you never experienced the fall. <laughs> As it says in Balyani's Know Thyself, God takes the last step on a journey that never happened. Muji put it this way. He said, the one who starts the inquiry does not finish the inquiry, but is finished by the inquiry. God takes the last step on the journey that never happened. Those are the words of the mystic. And you can see why they're regarded as mystic. <laughs> the journey that never happened. You, you will eventually see that all of it, birth, death, the fall, the awakening, undifferentiated consciousness, differentiated consciousness, falling into, into nescience, awakening from that, have all been a picture on the screen of the self. And none of it actually ever happened. But I just can't come right out and say that. I must... I must like a bodhisattva, go back into that darkness and lead you out of it. Is it how can I just say it never happened? You go, what? Huh? So from our experience, yes, we're in the midst of all of this. And so the bodhisattva is kind of ringing the bell, saying, over here, because you can't see. There is one bodhisattva in the Korean tradition, I can't remember who it was now. Um, and he's pictured as um, uh, standing with a shepherd's crook, and on the crook, oop, I just bumped the mic, and on the crook are three rings. And that's because in every one of his lifetimes he goes into the hell world where it's dark, and he, and he shakes it. So in the darkness they can hear the sound and follow it out. These words are, the, are, those, are those rings. Gently compassionately, lovingly, lovingly guiding you out with words that you can follow. If I give you the words that would be at, at the end of the road, you wouldn't be able to follow them. That's too far. It, it, it's apparently too far away. But you'll begin to, you will see at some point that the entire road has never actually happened. Like a long dream when you wake up never happened. That's why the analogy of the dream is so powerful and so common and has been used for thousands of years. But to just say, okay, it's all a dream, I wake up, it doesn't work. <laughs> That's why there are practices and there are teachers and there are gurus and there are books. and uh, Why? To, so that all of those are the bodhisattva with the shepherd's crook ringing. Sounding the sounding the the sound that you can follow out of the darkness. Hmm. Peggy Wood, a collective mosaic that is life. Yes, one huge collective mosaic, wherein every part is interrelated to every other, and if you take it apart, what do you have? Nothing. The mosaic is the whole. You cannot take it apart. If you do, what do you have? You have nothing. It's like when they try to, you know, a wave, right? A, a waveform, right? Is always described at the beginning. It, it has the, you know, 
the, the, the peak and the valley. Maybe go to the peak first and then the valley, right? If you time slice it anywhere, there's no wave. <laughs> it ceases to exist. This is the mystery of it. It's this whole thing, and yet this whole thing includes the time for the thing. Every form includes the, sp includes the space. Boy, we really are getting mystic today. I love it. <laughs> Diane, how, G I G P, how can self pray? I'm at a loss here in my usual practice when I try to get lost in the, in the mind games. Just pray. Don't ask questions. How does the self pray? How does the self pray? When you pray in whatever way you, that you pray, whatever way is the most meaningful and coming from your heart, that is the self-praying. <laughs> the, the honest opening of a heart, seeking the way out of darkness, is nothing other than God herself praying out of darkness. Lose yourself in the prayer and you will find that the prayer is God praying. God takes the last step on the journey that never happened. You're losing the sense of self and coming to the sense of true being, which, is, which has, been, has been named God. The desire to pray, pray is God. <laughs> the message, pray, is God. It also says in, in uh, Know Thyself by Balyani, the messenger is God. The messenger is He. The message is He. The one to whom the message is sent is also He. There are not two. Know yourself that your prayer is God praying and your prayer will be taken to the ultimate height. You will see that there's not even been a you that has been praying. The inspiration, the desire, making the time, it has all been inspired by that which you, you truly are. You are Him. He is you. There is no you, there is only Him. Or in your case, Her. <laughs> and so your prayers now become empowered. They're not a me, a little me, trying to get somewhere. They are literally the manifestation of the power of all being. You are losing yourself, or as the, the, uh, as the, the prayer of the monk is, Lord, replace me with you. How does that, how does that work for you, Diane? Let me be no more. <laughs> there is nothing but you. I allow you to take the last step on the journey that never happened. That's the meaning of nirvana, the disappearance of the self, of the, of the personal sense of self, disappearing of the notion of two. And everything that went into the experience of two has simply extinguished. That fire is out, it has no more fuel to burn. And so the sense of two is gone. This is the true motivation and goal of prayer, to become nothing, and in, as such become everything. He who loses his life for my sake shall find it. And he, he said in the Gospel of Thomas, he who drinks from my mouth shall become as I am, and I shall be Can you see, the mystic is the disappearance of the, of the sense of two into the infinite one. Hmm. Mm, thank you, Diane. David and Elaine, happiness and presence, a.k.a. our true self, seem to be synonymous. They are. Yeah, the self is not a thing. Right? I can see it is, it's happiness. It's these flowers. Right? They're damn happy. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Suffering appears to occur when we lose our sense of this and attach to the activity of consciousness or the ripples in the ocean of consciousness rather than the ocean of consciousness itself. Many things. That's exactly well said, David Lane. I don't know which one of you is saying it, both of you. You writing it together and editing, but um, yes, suffering occurs when we mistake the the manifestation for the for the substance. When we mistake the image in the mirror for the real thing, when we think of the image in our minds as being what we actually are, rather than just an image being beheld by what we actually are, that mistake, which is just the delusion of life is the birthplace of suffering, the birthplace of the false sense of self. There isn't an actual separate self, ever. <laughs> right. the, the activity of consciousness is everything you see. But you are not the activity of consciousness, you are that consciousness. And all of this is just the ripples in that ocean of the true Brahma Self. And oftentimes we end up being like the wave looking for the ocean. <laughs> you are the ocean. <laughs> We're just simply coming home from our, the prodigal son, which is completely, which is a metaphor, a parable to represent being completely absorbed in the external turns to come back to his father's house, come back to the source. The I is returning home to its origin. That doesn't mean this is lost. On the contrary, it is now experienced in its fullness without suffering. And so life becomes a celebration. Beautiful, David. And Elaine, well, well put. Brenda, thank you so much for that explanation. You're very welcome. Wonderful story, the life cycle of the flower. Thanks. Yeah, yeah Liza, good to see you. Good to see you. K H W A A C. Quack. Hi. <laughs> Quack. <laughs> uh, whatever it is, it's interesting. And Anja, namaste from Germany. Love to you. Ohm school is a blessing. Thank you very much for being here over and over and over again. Aneta, West psychology is very dualistic in their theories of the human psyche. Could we say the conscious, say the unconscious mind is the true self? Um, no, it is not a mind. Right, and I only say that. I mean, you, 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 we can. You could say yes. We could take anything, right, and put it to that purpose because they're just words. Remember, as Buddha pointed out, there's no, there's no self in dharmas. Right, words are just words, right. And we use them to give them meaning. So we need to kind of get together on our meaning. Yes, Western psychology is very dualistic. Western knowledge is dualistic. Human knowledge is dualistic because it's always based on subject-object. It's one thing describing something else in terms of yet something else. It is, the, it is, it is comparison. It is description. It is association. It is memory, it is compartmentalization, it is categorization. That is the sum total of human knowledge, and it is dualistic by nature. Now, when I use the word mind, I am not referring to consciousness. Right? You can. I could refer to the infinite mind. And in fact, mind, when it has been liberated from the sense of being something other than myself, becomes synonymous with consciousness. Even the word consciousness needs to be, to, uh, be liberated because that's associated with the body and the senses and what is being viewed and that sort of thing. But when I use the word mind, I am using it as simply as a word, an abstraction or a generalization that points to simply the flow of thoughts. Mind does not exist as a thing. There's not something generating thoughts. It is a word that represents the complex functioning of thoughts. Like wind is a word. There's no such thing as wind as a thing, you know, like the cloud moving air. It is air in motion. What makes the air go in motion? An incredibly complex set of events. The uneven heating of the earth, the sun, the atmosphere, the, <laughs> the moisture in the air. 
you know, the, the, um, the, the topography, all of that go into the motion of, we call this motion wind, right? which is a, a simplification. This is what the mind does, so I call it that. Mind is a simplification of an incredibly complex flow of thoughts. Right? One thought after another, these thoughts form patterns. What is the unconscious mind, what they would call the unconscious mind? Well, it's, it's this imaginary place where thoughts go when we're not thinking them. We think there's like this some kind of repository. But all there is to the unconscious mind are habits of behavior. Uh, it recognize that thoughts appear in patterns. We call that the origin of that pattern the unconscious mind, but we'd have no such concept if we didn't see the pattern. So it doesn't exist as an entity either. It too is an abstraction. What do we actually experience? A flow of thought. So let's look at the thought. What is a thought? Well, the thought itself is made up of little 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 piece parts. Is it a thing in and of itself, or is it too just something that represents something else? And what is it in its substance? Is it a thing? Well, it can't be a thing because it doesn't exist without me. There's no, you know, there's no thought over there. I'm going to go over and get it. it. It's inherent in me, like a dream at night. It is me. It is coming from me. It's completely dependent on me. And that means that that thought is simply a ripple in this ocean of being. It is consciousness aware of itself. And I've taken it as, as far as it can go and deconstructed mind. There is no such thing as mind. <laughs> There's only the flow of thoughts. And what is thought? That's another thought. What it actually is is simply consciousness in activity. Consciousness is not a thing. Right? It is impossible to describe it. But we can see what it does. Everything. So this is consciousness. The way a song is music. The music is not in the song, it is not confined to the song, it is not limited by the song, yet the entirety of music is, in, is, is present and made manifest in every single song, and there's an infinite number of them. That is the nature of thought and consciousness, as best as I can put it. <laughs> oh, thank you for that question, Aneta. Did I say it? Aneta? Aneta? Anyway. I love the Gnostic Gospels. Wash hands. <laughs> yes, the Gnostic Gospels are, are, are. Yeah, well, they're beautiful. They they reveal things that, that you know, they didn't make it into the, uh, into the original, into the original for a lot of reasons. But yes, there's much a much more. They seem to confirm the mystical thread, that has run through Christianity from the beginning. Carl Lucy, you blew my mind today, GP. Carl has left the building. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, wonderful, good. We brought it right to an hour because this, this epi these episodes of Ohm School Live are limited to an hour, and I don't have Lisa here to enforce the rules, so I have to be a good, disciplined soldier and, um, and do it myself. So hopefully this was valuable to you all. A little discourse, a little meditation, a little Q&A. Thank you all for being here today, and um, Lisa will be back with us next week, and I think we do have a subject picked out. I can't remember what it is right now, but we do have one. So thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. I love you all. Namaste.